So we'll now go to the fourth of our um, national uh, reviews. Um, and uh, for this, we have uh, Richard Newman, uh, who's kindly agreed to speak about England. Uh, Richard began his archaeological career in South Wales in the early 1980s, and he's been a member of MSRG since the late 1980s. Um, he worked both as a contract, contract archaeologist and a local authority curator, holding senior posts at Wessex Archaeology, Lancaster Archaeology University Archaeological Unit, and Wardle Armstrong, and being in charge of the Historic Environment Services for Lancashire, Cumbria, and now the East Riding of Yorkshire. He project managed the archaeological responses to a variety of major schemes in the 1990s, including Wessex Water Pipelines, the Newbury Bypass, and the Second Seven Crossing English Approach Roads. More recently, he project managed the archaeological works for the East Anglia One Cable Trench in Suffolk and is currently closely involved with similar projects in East Yorkshire. So thank you very much, uh, Richard, for agreeing to speak on England. Um, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. OK, well, I'll be concentrating on linear infrastructure projects and the result of that means that I will be primarily looking at medieval rural settlement. So, a repeated lament in the recent reiterations of the regional research frameworks for England is the lack of archaeological work carried out on medieval rural settlements, especially in contrast to work undertaken in towns. In my own curatorial area uh, of the East Riding of Yorkshire, there have been four substantive medieval urban archaeological interventions in the past year, two in Hull and two in Beverley but none in relation to medieval rural settlement. Development-led archaeology tends to be away from the old centres of communities and avoids known archaeological sites like recorded deserted medieval settlements. Non-development-led archaeological research like the CAUSE project and community-led excavations, however, continue to make a substantive contribution to medieval set settlement research. Next slide, please. One area of development-led archaeology that, superficially at least, would be expected to make a contribution to understanding medieval rural settlement is the large-scale large linear infrastructure projects that we have seen across England, but especially in the south and east. Transect through time, timeline, slice through history, route to the past, all the types of phrases that have been used in the titles of monographs and articles describing the results of archaeological work on linear infrastructure projects. These phrases are intended to convey the nature of such projects, their linear character, their ability to both bisect and dissect a landscape, their role as pathways to understanding the past. There is an implication that such schemes are almost time machines offering vignettes into history. Clearly, there is an appreciation that some linear infrastructure schemes have provided great opportunities for furthering archaeological understanding of the areas traversed by them. The engineering projects that enabled these archaeological insights include new transport routes, pipelines and power cable trenches. In England, many of these projects in the 21st century are no longer overseen through the local authority planning system, but are moved through the planning process by central government agencies under development consent orders. Generally, this means that those carrying out such works are prepared to abide by the rules set out by central government for dealing with archaeological remains discovered through the development process. Next slide, please. The level of archaeological investigation carried out on such schemes and how it has increased in recent years is hinted at by the costs of undertaking archaeological works. In the 1990s, the total cost of fieldwork, both evaluation and follow-up mitigation, for a major scheme like the second seven crossing English approach throws was 318,000. In 2017 to 18, the contract value of just the mitigation field work for the East Anglia One onshore works comprising a cable trench was 12 million. Small beer, of course, in comparison to HS2. Archaeological responses to linear infrastructure developments as part of the planning system began in England in the late 1960s and 70s with the extension of the motorway network. Next slide, please. By the later 1980s, a more systematic approach to such developments was evolving in response to the professionalization of archaeology, its incorporation within local authority planning advisory systems, and the codification of environmental impact assessment methodologies. Next slide, please. 
By the early 1990s, when I wrote for the then a long and winding, then IFA, a long and winding road, archaeology, environmental impacts assessment and road schemes, the archaeological basic approach to linear infrastructure developments was in place. Schemes were assessed, major sites avoided, and other sites excavated or otherwise recorded. It is fair to say that in the early 1990s, with the then national government's focus on road improvements and network expansion, the focus of archaeological thinking was on methodologies of assessment and recording of archaeological remains on linear infrastructure projects, rather than on the meaning of the results. In England, there is thus a good four decades of solid, systematic archaeological work on linear infrastructure developments. Yet it's only now that archaeologists begin to ask what all the new data collated as a result means, beyond the creation of linear clusters of sites within historic environment records. In essence, little has changed in the broad methodological approach to the archaeology of linear infrastructure schemes in England since the early 1990s. New IT related techniques and resources have emerged in the later 1990s and 21st century, however, that at least increase capability for accurate assessment. These include wider availability and use of GIS as an analytical tool, the internet as a research tool, online satellite imagery, LIDAR, the capacity to deal with so-called big data and multispectral analytical techniques. The initial response to a linear scheme is to identify the known archaeological resource, to scope the likely unknown resource and to quantify the risk both posed to the scheme in terms of the likely required mitigation. Atop the list of initial tasks is the identification of showstoppers, those sites that might pose a threat to the project's viability. World Heritage Sites and Scheduled Monuments come into this category. Generally, if possible, these will be avoided at an early stage in scheme consideration. For other known sites, a balance will be sought between the costs of archaeological investigation, both direct and indirect through possible delays to engineering requirements, and the costs of avoidance. As far as possible, most linear infrastructure developers want to avoid unknowns and have a clear idea of the duration and costs of the likely mitigation archaeological works. Often, however, within an infrastructure scheme, there can be considerably more flexibility in relation to this undeliverable need for certainty than in some other forms of development programs. Now, medieval archaeology poses a distinctive set of challenges when it comes to assessing archaeological remains for linear infrastructure projects. The subject is bisected by a disciplinary and evidential divide. On one side is the early medieval period, which along with at least rural civilian Roman Britain and non-monumental prehistory, for the most part is not decipherable from maps and documents, is not upstanding as structures or earthworks, and is thus likely to be largely hidden and invisible. On the other side is the high and late medieval period, which can seem well documented and to an extent readable from maps, with many occupation sites either surviving as still functioning settlements or as identifiable earthwork complexes. For many historic environment researchers and for too many consultant and contract archaeologists, the later medieval landscape can seem wholly visible, identifiable and thus readily accessible. Apart from the clear interpretive trap for understanding the later medieval landscape that I've just telegraphed, the main implication of this evidential division is that the impact of linear infrastructure projects on data retrieval for the early medieval period differs considerably from the later medieval period. Consequently, I'm going to separate for review purposes the pre and post conquest periods. Next slide, please. With the exception of some churches, early medieval settlement remains are usually not visible at the surface as upstanding remains or earthworks. Those that lie outside of existing settlements, such as villages with the Church of Anglo-Saxon origin, are difficult to identify from documents, although greater use by consultants of Doomsday Book would be helpful. Thus, the known sites will be those recorded in local authority HERs and previously discovered either accidentally as a byproduct of development or through area-based research. For an archaeological assessor of a linear infrastructure project, it is difficult to identify early medieval settlement remains that are not already known. Maps and place names may help a little, but generally will lack precision spatially or temporally. Aerial photography, satellite imagery and LIDAR may provide indications of enclosures, but as early medieval domestic, industrial and agricultural structures are usually post-built, new earth complexes will not be recognised. <clears throat> 
Noted enclosure systems will not be datable, and thus any such early medieval evidence will be difficult to distinguish from later prehistoric remains. Indeed, in a region like Cumbria, where unusually earthworks are present and structures sometimes stone founded, some early medieval sites will be continuations of late prehistoric settlements. Geophysics will not advance certainty much beyond that of the other remote sensing techniques, and even at a post-EIA stage, uh, when evaluation trenching will be undertaken, a single pit, post hole or ditch section, often lacking finds, will not help to identify early medieval remains. Next slide, please. One solution sometimes put forward is a metal detection survey of the linear infrastructure entire route, argued to increase the likelihood of early medieval site identification through the recovery of metalwork. In 2017, metal detection where possible field walking was carried out on the East Anglia 1 cable trench project, which stretched for 34 kilometers from the mouth of the Deben, next slide please, Deben estuary and around the north of Ipswich. This assessment technique was an afterthought undertaken after the evaluation and to an extent as a response to the lack of early medieval evidence retrieved. Clearly, for a scheme which passed within a couple of kilometres of Sutton Hoo, a perceived need to identify early medieval sites is understandable. As a result of undertaking such work across the entire cable route, three early medieval metal objects were recovered from three sites. Only one of the identified locations turned out to have early medieval remains below the plough soil. The difficulties in identifying early medieval remains using the suite of techniques currently practically applicable within the assessment and evaluation phases of linear infrastructure projects mean that the conservation opportunity to avoid significant remains is frequently unavailable. Indeed, the recognition of significance is questionable. Consequently, early medieval settlement remains often appear as surprises during the mitigation phase of a project usually on sites that have been identified as having archaeological potential, but where the nature of that potential has not been defined. On most projects where mitigation fieldwork is targeted at crop marks or geophysical anomalies, unclearly dated by evaluation, the potential of such sites remains for practical purposes unknown at the commencement of the mitigation phase of fieldwork. Often the multi-period nature of the remains may not be appreciated, and an early medieval phase can easily remain hidden until excavation. Such was the situation at some sites on the East Anglia 1 cable trench scheme in Suffolk. One defined site near Little Beelings, next slide please, had been identified tentatively at the assessment stage as having Romano British potential. This was subsequently confirmed by trial trench evaluation. Under excavation, the site did indeed have a large aisle building of Romana British date, believed to be an agricultural building formed by a, forming part of a likely villa complex. This was surrounded by sunken featured buildings, one shown here, uh, exclusively containing late Roman material. And these are considered to be part of a likely fifth century late antique phase. In addition, next slide please, one post-built hall type structure was identified seemingly occupied sometime in the 7th to 8th centuries. No evidence of continuity between the late antique and early medieval phases has been recognized. A similar structure, found, a similar structure was found last year on a late Iron Age and Romana British site on the Dogger Bank cable trench in East Yorkshire. Unfortunately, only one fragment of possible post-Roman post ceramic was found associated with the post-built structure whereas the artifactual evidence from the Little Beeling site was relatively prolific and unequivocal in the assemblage's mid-Saxon attribution. A few kilometres to the east of Little Beelings, within Martlesham near Woodbridge, a site was identified during the assessment and valuation stages on top of a small hill. Next slide, please. It was considered, uh, following evaluation, to have only moderate potential of undefined date. The site under excavation had Neolithic, Romana British and Mid-Saxon phases, of which the most significant was the latter. This early medieval phase comprised boundaries and a series of post-built hall-like structures. Situated on a hill above one of the identified foci of the multiple nuclei later medieval settlement of Martlesham, it has been postulated that the settlement remains may represent an early Caput site. In conclusion, for the early medieval period, where sites have not been previously recognised, 
Site identification during the assessment and evaluation phases of a linear infrastructure project can be difficult. Evidence of occupation is frequently missed or at least misidentified where it forms part of multi-period sites. While the sites will be identified during mitigation works, the opportunities for avoidance and thus preservation in situ will have been lost. Moreover, unless there is a sufficient understanding on behalf of the developer and flexibility built into the archaeological project design, the investigation of these sites may be compromised by a lack of planned resources. Fortunately, on the East Anglia 1 project, this did not happen, and in due course, the early medieval sites should be fully published and contribute significantly to an advancement in knowledge. So moving on to later medieval settlement archaeology. Outside of the far north and southwest of England, earlier medieval settlement remains mostly do not survive as upstanding earthworks, and this has implications for infrastructure route selection. Thus, one of the key distinctions between later medieval archaeological remains and those of the earlier periods in relation to linear infrastructure schemes lies in the nature and implications of route choice. For earlier periods, the course of a linear project is largely random. For remains of later medieval date, it is clearly selective. Routes of all types of infrastructure will, where possible, avoid currently occupied settlements not to conserve archaeological remains, but to avoid impacting living people's property. Route planners will also avoid showstoppers, such as scheduled medieval earthworks, and will usually avoid non-designated upstanding earthwork sites identified during the scoping or assessment phases of a project. Next slide, please. Consequently, still occupied settlements of medieval origin and known past deserted medieval settlements recorded in HERs will be deliberately avoided at the route planning stage. It is this approach that ensures on many linear infrastructure projects, there is a relatively or proportionately low instance of impact on later medieval settlement remains. For example, the recent Dogger Bank onshore works cable trench in East Yorkshire, which is 32 kilometers long, encountered no later medieval remains other than a few boundaries and plentiful evidence for ridge and furrow. The route assessment could clearly and accurately state on the basis of known sites recorded in the HER and on 19th century ordnance survey maps that the route avoided the sites of likely medieval settlements, but cut its way through a series of definable medieval open common fields. Between 2003 and 2006, next slide please, the A1 in North Yorkshire was upgraded to motorway status. The route included two sections of new road, 16.5 kilometres and 5.3 kilometres long. The course of the road was constrained by the pre-existing route, which itself already bypassed any existing settlements. At the assessment stage, most of the route was seen as crossing through the field systems of this champion landscape of nucleated settlements surrounded by open common arable fields. As would be expected in such an area, the focus of the site discovery was on the later prehistoric and Romano British phases of landscape evolution. Unusually, one significant medieval site was not avoided but investigated. Near Weatherby, a likely medieval estate centre was identified during the assessment as the site of Ingmanthorpe Hall. Excavation, however, found not just the remains of a moated manorial site, but facing it across a road was a line of tofts, comprising a settlement occupied between the 12th to 14th centuries. This settlement was unsuspected by the archaeological contractors before the site was excavated. Route selection offer, operates under different constraints dependent on the nature of the infrastructure, and this influences the likely impact on medieval settlement. For the construction of water pipelines, for example, the preference is for the route to be close to roads for access, and they need to follow gradients to take advantage of gravity. Railways are similarly, of, co of course, similarly constrained by gradients. This restricts the placement of the infrastructure route and thus the capacity to avoid obstacles such as known archaeological remains. A northwest water pipeline in Cumbria in 2014 to 15 was routed to avoid existing settlements. Uh, next slide, please. Including the hamlet of Redmain a settlement whose medieval origins are readily readable at both ground level and from maps and aerial imagery. There was only limited flexibility in route movement, and while this allowed its impact on some excellent ridge and furrow earthworks to be reduced, it did not allow the avoidance of a 
later medieval site discovered during a route assessment. The site lay between the settlements of Redmain and Brightkirk within the township of Redmain. It was identified initially from Google Earth satellite imagery. Next slide, please. Documentary uh, research indicated the site was part of a grange of Gisborough Priory, and the area of the Grange domain was known as the Trinities. Evaluation trial trenching revealed two walls in separate locations, later medieval artifacts, and some likely residual Roman material. The finalization of the pipeline route avoided the one wall but could not be deviated to avoid the other. An excavation ensued and a later medieval stone building was found to be built above a Romano British stone built structure. Further documentary and landscape research and associated with the post excavation assessment found the medieval building to be part of a wider landscape of Grange associated remains. Site appears to have had an upstanding building as late as the 18th century and was known as Chapel Guards. A later medieval burial found within the stone building and 18th century antiquarian accounts indicate the structure investigated was the chapel of the Grange. The impact of varying types of linear infrastructure projects within a champion landscape where scheme route flexibility should allow for site avoidance can be considered by examining one region, the East Riding of Yorkshire. This region has likely seen one of the highest densities of linear infrastructure projects in England thus far in the 21st century. The reasons are its North Sea littoral, which make it a convenient landfall for gas from the North Sea's oil and natural gas fields, and more recently for offshore wind generated electricity. It is also largely unurbanized, unlike Teesside, and its terrain is unchallenging, unlike the North York, Yorkshire Moors. Moreover, it is convenient for the power network as a legacy of its proximity to the major former coal-powered power stations at Saltend, Drax, Nottingley and Ferrybridge. The East Riding of Yorkshire can also claim to be one of the key regions for the development of medieval settlement research with seminal studies undertaken by the likes of Keith Allison. The type site of Warren Percy lies just to the north of the modern local authority boundary, boundary. and the Walden landscape within which Warren Percy sits occupies the northern and central parts of the East Riding. The Wolds and Holderness especially feature numerous deserted and shrunken later medieval settlement sites. Later Please, medieval... Five minutes. That's fine. Later medieval settlement archaeology thus features strongly as a particular distinctive aspect of the East Riding's environment. In general, the East Riding is a classic champion landscape of later medieval settlement, featuring nucleated settlements surrounded by regular two, three or four field systems, with the occasional dispersed farmstead, which was often moated. Most of these sites are known and recorded on the HER, a fair number are protected through scheduling, and discoverable new sites can be readily identified from Google Earth satellite imagery and LIDAR. Consequently, linear infrastructure schemes usually can be easily routed to avoid later medieval sites, and for the most part they do. There have been 23 such schemes in the East Riding in the past two decades. Next slide, please. And only three have found, oh, sorry, skip on. And only three have found medieval settlement remains. The most significant has probably been the current A63 excavations within the urban area of Hull, where the site of the original 12th to early 13th century settlement of Wyke in Holderness appears to have been located. In rural areas, very few sites have been discovered. In areas outside the Champion landscapes and their medieval nucleated settlements, the outcomes for later medieval settlement archaeology from the impacts of linear infrastructure projects can be very different. The East Anglia 1 cable trench is a good example of this. Next slide, please. At the assessment stage, the, the, the historic environment consultants stated that later medieval remains were unlikely as later medieval settlements tended to be situated where modern settlements occur. An overly simplistic statement for any area of England, but probably almost justifiable if applied to East Yorkshire. However, certainly not to Suffolk. Southern Suffolk features nucleated villages that are often the result of post-medieval coalescence, polyfocal settlements, isolated churches, and myriad isolated farmsteads or small hamlets. For those who can read the landscape, it has settlements that grew on the edges of waste in the later medieval period. There's evidence not just of desertion, but shrinkage and shifting. In essence, it is complicated. In South Suffolk, routing linear infrastructure to avoid present-day settlement is absolutely no guarantee of avoiding later medieval settlement.
The inanity of the consultant's claim became obvious at the evaluation stage, with potential later medieval settlement remains highlighted in six areas. All six areas were revealed through excavation documentary research to have later medieval settlement remains. One, one other area was identified during the course of the mitigation field work. At the western end of the route, three separate sites investigated parts of the settlement of Bullen or Bullen Green. Excavation combined with documentary research indicates that Bullen was a post-conquest settlement of a type locally known as a Thai. A similar settlement was identified and subsequently excavated on the line of HS2 at New Year's Green in Essex in the last year. These dispersed settlement sites around an area of common grazing are only just starting to be archaeologically excavated. Elsewhere along the EA1 route at Claydon, an isolated holding was identified close to the River Lark and at some distance from the medieval parish centre. Next slide, next slide, please. The one building. The one building noted contained a drying kiln, and it was considered the structure may have been linked to a water mill and dated to the 11th to 15th centuries. Further isolated sites were discovered. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, next slide, please. At the mouth of the River Deben, a settlement identified from documents as Preston, a hamlet of the Vill Villa of Bordsey, was identified through domestic remains and port infrastructure associated with the 13th to 14th century, previously referred to as Lost Port of Bordsey. The conclusion is that in non-champion landscapes, as in Suffolk and Essex, the recognition of later medieval settlement is much more difficult at the assessment stage than it is in champion landscapes. Linear infrastructure schemes, however, are proving useful tools for discovery in non-champion landscapes and for advancing the understanding. The they are, so I can't, well, I'm sorry. Sorry, I can hear what somebody else speaking. Oh, I said I should do some planting. I'm taking the seeds for the mm -hmm. project, so I can see. Sorry, I can are. hear somebody else speaking. Okay. Yes. Everyone, make sure their microphones. Because switch. you never look around to see. No. Linear infrastructure schemes, however, proving useful tools for discovery in non-champion landscapes and for advancing the understanding of some of the less well-researched forms of medieval rural settlement. So in conclusion and summary, above all, from a developer's perspective, unknown archaeological remains require time and money to investigate are uh, one of their identifiable project risks. As part of any risk management strategy for archaeology, the reduction of unknowns, surprises, will be paramount. For the archaeologist, it is very difficult to identify unknown early medieval sites within programs of assessment and evaluation for linear infrastructure schemes. Simply the admittance of this within such programs would be an improvement. Linear infrastructure projects are good at site discovery for early, earlier medieval remains. The recognition of later medieval settlement remains at the assessment stage is easier than it is for earlier medieval settlement remains. In champion landscapes, it should be possible to identify and avoid most, if not all, later medieval settlement remains, though the capacity for this does vary dependent on the nature of the infrastructure being built. Where avoidance is not possible, good assessment should at least mean that surprises do not occur and mitigatory work should be properly planned and resourced. In general, for later medieval settlement remains in champion landscapes, site conservation should be high and new discoveries low. Useful opportunities for will occur from time to time, however, to investigate archaeologically less well understood sites such as the Sarch and Granges. In non champion landscape, previously unrecorded later medieval sites should at least be identifiable, identifiable at the evaluation stage, but all too often they are not picked up at the assessment stage. Careful analysis of the existing landscape, understanding of regional variations in settlement forms and patterns, use of available online remote. Uh, imaging resources and a basic understanding of readily available and usually published relevant historic documents in most cases will make identifications possible during the route assessment stage. The assessment and evaluation stages of linear infrastructure projects in non-champion landscapes are leading to the discovery of new later medieval settlement sites. Mitigatory fieldwork is providing opportunities to advance the understanding of less well-researched forms of later medieval settlement as exposing and emphasising the variety of later medieval settlement across England beyond the standard nucleated village. Understanding the local and regional landscape in the medieval period is key to gaining the most from these newly discovered and investigated early and later medieval sites.
Merely observing these sights as beads along a random string is not good enough. Opportunities need to be taken to understand change and complexity at the landscape scale. To this end, a research framework for England focused on the opportunities for advancing the understanding of medieval settlement through linear infrastructure schemes could be of benefit. It should highlight best practice in fieldwork and post-fieldwork analysis and publication, critically examine advances over the past two decades afforded by such work, and explore opportunities for further progress. Final slide, please.